Now, Your Excellency, it's my honor and privilege to welcome you to Bharat to uh, give a presentation and speech. Or the road to Reykjavik, 
that we build together. We brought the NASA astronauts to Iceland to train, and as such, Iceland played a key role in putting a man on the moon. Perhaps equally important, Americans brought basketball and rock and roll to Iceland. <laughs> but just as Iceland was a strategic focal point during the Cold War, this country's innate love of peace came to life almost magically during the 1986 Reykjavik summit between Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. That meeting signaled that change was possible, and within five years, the Cold War was over. Now let us see the past for a minute and talk a bit about the present and the future. 25 years after that meeting at Hoffi House, we are living in a new world. This has meant changes in the U.S. Icelandic relationship. Most importantly, in 2006, the Catholic baseball closed. I know that some people were unhappy to see the base close and were displeased with the way it was handled. Others go even further and read into the base closure a message that the United States no longer cares about Iceland and it is no longer interested in the relationship. I reject that assertion. As the first U.S. ambassador to Iceland since the closure of the base, I can say unequivocally that the relationship remains vibrant and robust. Our relationship is growing and diversified. From a relationship that was centered on the hard security imperatives of the, 21st, of the 20th century, in the 21st century we are developing a partnership that is broader and builds on the trust and close connections that we've built over the last few decades. There are four areas that I would like to bring to your attention where we see that relationship growing. Arctic cooperation, trade and investment, security, cultural and scientific cooperation. Let me first speak about the Arctic. This is an area of emerging importance that will only grow in significance over the next few years. Climate change in the Arctic is happening twice as fast as in other parts of the world, leading to unforeseen challenges and opportunities. The United States and Iceland are Arctic nations. This region matters greatly to both of us. Like Iceland, we believe that the decisions that we make now will have long-lasting implications in the future when there is increased access to resources and to transportation corridors. We value our cooperation with Iceland within the eight-nation Arctic Council. In fact, when you compare the United States Arctic policy with Iceland's Arctic policy, they're very similar. We both favor using the Arctic Council as the main forum of international cooperation in the region. We both believe economic development is possible, but it must be environmentally sustainable. And we both want the participation of indigenous people in decision making. In the waters around Iceland, we have seen a dramatic increase in tourist activity. This is positive from an economic point of view, but it also helps visitors become very acquainted with the, with, the, with the beautiful and complex ecosystems in this part of the world. But as the number of visiting ships increase, we need to ensure that the environment is protected and that our emergency services are ready to act when needed. Iceland is a key partner for us in the Arctic. And we welcome their leadership, particularly as the Arctic Council becomes more action-oriented. This was demonstrated by the agreement signed in Nuuk on search and rescue and the agreement to work together on an oil spill response. Let us now move to another area, trade and investment. I think it is easy to forget sometimes that the United States is already the largest foreign investor in Iceland, and it should be noted that that investment is increasing. 
several U.S. companies are demonstrating continued interest in establishing or expanding their presence in Iceland. As just one example, in February 2011, the U.S. company Globe Specialty Metals was responsible for the single largest foreign direct investment in Iceland since the crash of 2008. The total investment of the silicon plant is estimated at $152 million, and this investment will diversify Einstein's economy and provide jobs in a region that sorely needs it. In another example, this is something that you already know, U.S. aluminum companies have invested over 300 billion ISK in Iceland and developed the aluminum industry into one of the pillars of Iceland's economy. In the last decade, aluminum exports more than doubled and now constitute 40% of total exports, which again help diversify Iceland's economy. If I can cite just one more example, in September of 2011, Turner Broadcasting signed a deal to acquire the company behind the Lazy Town children's program. Turner decided to keep production in Iceland and to protect hundreds of jobs and a capital investment of about 2.5 billion ISK. But this goes both ways. Icelandic entrepreneurs are already making a mark in the U.S. Morel, a powerhouse, a powerhouse in the food processing industry, has been in North America for nearly 20 years. Cutting-edge technology companies such as CCP and Usur have set up operations in the U.S. recently, and they're also thriving. They have generated hundreds of jobs in the U.S. Tourism is another sector that we enjoy promoting, and I am proud to say that more Americans than any other nationality visited Iceland in 2011. And with Delta Airlines returning this summer and Iceland Air opening its route to Denver, we expect that number to increase in both directions. The third pillar that I would like to focus on is security. <coughs> Even without the pace, we continue to enjoy a close relationship and cooperate across a broad range of security issues. It is important to note that the United States remains firmly committed to Iceland's defense through NATO and the 1951, 1951 U.S.-Iceland bilateral defense agreement. But this cooperation is also showing in different areas. In June, the U.S. military participated in the biennial NATO military exercise Northern Vikings. Among the many contributions we made at that time, we brought six F-16s and about 150 military personnel from the Wisconsin National Guard. In August of this, of this same year, the U.S. Air Force brought four F-15s to assist with NATO air policing and to ensure the sovereignty of Icelandic airspace. Also, in just a few days, representatives from our two governments will gather in Washington to present our annual strategic dialogue. A key focus of this discussion will be to enhance cooperation on 21st century security challenges such as cyber threats and international crime. Finally, the fourth pillar of our relationship includes a growing array of activities in science, education, and culture. Now, I could give you an entire speech on these areas alone, but because of time constraints, I'm just going to give you a few examples. Let's first talk about scientific cooperation. In addition to the many, many university partnerships that we can even keep track of because they keep generating new ones every year, the U.S. government provides millions of dollars to uh, various institutions to support collaborative research and scientific projects in Iceland. The National Science Foundation alone has awarded over $700 million to such endeavors in Iceland since 1980. Active National Science Foundation grants amount to about $140 million. 
this grants health experts from Einstein and the US to push the frontiers of knowledge in, in a broad range of subjects, including, for example, the role of black carbon in climate change and unlocking the mysteries of Iceland's magnificent glaciers and volcanoes. Our educational cooperation is equally robust. There's nothing more satisfying that, than seeing so many American and Icelandic students traveling back and forth between our two countries and taking advantage of the excellent educational opportunities that both countries have to offer. These students are not only getting great education, but they're also increasing their multicultural understanding and broadening their global perspective. The Fulbright Commission, of course, is our flagship organization promoting these exchanges. And over the past 50 years, about 50, 1,300 grantees, 1,300 grantees have received support. About 700 from Iceland and about 500 from the US. And they have come as students or as, as scholars. Finally, on the cultural exchanges side between our two nations, there's much going on. Just this year, Seattle celebrated its 25th anniversary as a sister city of Reykjavik by participating at the Grand Marshal of Reykjavik's well-known culture life. In association with that event, we have musicians, we have artists, Native American performers, and many others take part of the festivities. I have never had so much fun in my life, and I look forward to the next one as well. But in addition, the U.S. Embassy has supported some of the premier Icelandic events, such as the Reykjavik Jazz Festival, the Art Festival, Gay Pride Parade, and exhibits at Iceland's top art galleries and other activities. And trust me, we have an equally exciting set of programs for the coming year. sectors, I think that you cannot help but draw the conclusion that our bilateral partnership is thriving. Now that is not to say that there are disagreements between us. It is no secret that the United States and several other close partners of Iceland disagree with commercial whaling and have urged Iceland to comply with uh, the moratorium by the International Whaling Commission. But as often happens, when good friends disagree, this topic sometimes leads to heated discussions. But good friends are also able to conduct these discussions in the spirit of mutual respect. Above all, I don't think that any of us should make the mistake of letting this disagreement define our friendship, as we have sometimes heard. Decades of close friendship and cooperation cannot be ignored and tossed aside because we disagree on one issue. Friends talk about their differences. So let me, let me conclude by returning to a theme that I've been mentioning throughout this speech. The human dimension of the bilateral relationship. The partnerships that I'm talking about are ultimately based in people-to-people -people contact. Whether we're talking about students, researchers, scientists, artists, engineers, business partners, or tourists, we have a great history of cooperation. When Icelanders meet Americans, they create ideas that turn into business startups, that generate scientific discoveries, what a beautiful artistic creation. This people-to-people -people contact is happening now in many different areas. Fashion design, the arts, computer programming, engineering, science, and the list goes on. And I run into these connections when I talk to Icelanders almost every day. It seems as though someone always 
uh, has a personal connection to, uh, to America. Perhaps they studied in Boston, Iowa, California, or have friends living in Seattle, or a family who recently took a vacation in Florida, in Orlando. You also see the tangible manifestations of that relationship at the grocery stores, at the movie theaters, and on the radio. It's a relationship that comes to life every single day when we see American tourists strolling down Loyalever and drinking and eating at some of those famous places on that street. But the key point is that it is these personal connections that serve as the underpinnings of everything we have accomplished. And it is these personal connections that will sustain our partnership in the future.